Uh, Subcommittee on the Middle East, North Africa, and Global Counterterrorism will come to order without objection. Chair is authorized to declare a recess of the subcommittee at any point, and all members will have five days to submit statements, extraneous material, and questions for the record, subject to the length limitation in the rules. As a reminder to members, please keep your video function on at all times, even when you're not recognized. Members are responsible for muting and unmuting themselves, and please remember to mute yourself after you finish speaking. Consistent with HRS 8 and the accompanying regulations, staff will only mute members and witnesses as appropriate when they are not under recognition to eliminate background noise. Uh, we have quorum. We'll uh, get started. I'll recognize myself for opening remarks. Uh, pursuant to notice, we are holding a hearing on the current crisis in Lebanon. This subcommittee last held a hearing on Lebanon in November 2019 after mass protests began, bringing more than a million people into the streets. The spontaneity, durability, and size of these demonstrations signified deep frustration with the Lebanese political system and the pillars of corruption that uh, hold that uphold it. Uh, today, as we approach the first anniversary of the Beirut port explosion on August 4th, an unavoidable man-made catastrophe, an avoidable rather man-made catastrophe that was symptomatic of the same corruption we will assess Lebanon's rapidly deteriorating political, economic, and humanitarian crises and try to offer practical policy measures that the Biden administration should consider in response. The World Bank assesses that Lebanon's ongoing economic collapse, and I quote, is likely to rank in the top 10, possibly top three, most severe crisis episodes globally since the mid 19th century, close quote. This is due in large part to the precipitous depreciation of the Lebanese lira by roughly 130% in 2020, falling much further throughout 2021. Massive inflation led the government to reduce or eliminate subsidies on essential goods, leading to widespread blackouts and shortages, as well as uh, rising tensions. Military leaders warned this vicious cycle has devalued the salaries of military personnel and thereby created an unstable security situation. Meanwhile, the UN claims that Lebanon's public water system could collapse at any moment, likely within weeks, and 80% of Lebanese households lack money to buy adequate food. These are startling statistics. The World Bank has also called the crisis deliberate because as with the Beirut port explosion, decision makers in Lebanon are aware of the problems, but they're failing spectacularly at doing anything to fix them. The resignation of Prime Minister designate Saad Hariri two weeks ago after nine months of efforts to form a government uh, illustrates Lebanon's political gridlock and the inability or unwillingness of political elites to avert or mitigate the ongoing economic crisis and resulting instability. This presents a challenge to the international community which seeks to tie assistance packages to the implementation of greater accountability, transparency, and anti-corruption measures. I encourage the Biden administration to strongly support such an approach and also consider additional measures to go after corruption among Lebanese officials if the status quo persists or worsens, sending the signal that we will use the power of our financial system to root out corruption and to promote stability. At the same time, the consequences of further deterioration are extremely worrisome and must be avoided. For example, the region cannot absorb another massive refugee outflow. We must be mindful of Lebanon's recent civil war and pervasive sectarian tensions, and also avoid any steps that catalyze sectarianism uh, and internal conflict. I'm particularly sensitive to the fact that a breakdown of the state would likely strengthen the influence of U.S. adversaries in Lebanon, including Iran, Syria, and Hezbollah. To that end, I want to quickly reiterate my strong support for ongoing U.S. partnership with the Lebanese Armed Forces. As I have said repeatedly before, I share many of my colleagues' concerns about Hezbollah's massive rocket and missile arsenal in Lebanon and the lapse in ability to prevent Hezbollah's military buildup and dangerous activities on Lebanon's borders that threaten Israel. But based on what we consistently hear from national security officials, uh, trusted Lebanese counterparts and security analysts, that despite its deficiencies, the Lebanese Armed Forces remains a vitally important counterweight to Hezbollah and is extremely reliable in terms of end-use monitoring. The LAF has earned our continued 
support even as it struggles to protect Lebanese sovereignty during this acute economic crisis. And finally, since 2011, more than a million Syrian refugees have migrated to Lebanon, placing strain on Lebanese public services and host communities. The U.S. has provided more than $2.7 billion in humanitarian assistance in Lebanon since fiscal year 2012 and must continue to meet the needs of refugees. I hope, I hope that we will see an international effort to assist the people of Lebanon and to help prevent a total humanitarian collapse. I'm really grateful that this morning we have a distinguished panel of witnesses who are abundantly qualified to help us better understand what's happening in Lebanon, navigate these really vexing challenges, and offer suggestions uh, to protect the U.S. interests and promote the long-term well-being of Lebanon. I want to thank them again for their participation before handing it over to Ranking Member Wilson. Uh, so thanks to all of our witnesses, and I'll now yield to the Ranking Member for his opening remarks. Thank you, Chairman Ted Deutsch, for calling this important hearing, and we sincerely appreciate the dedication of the witnesses that are appearing today. Lebanon has endured significant hardship following the end of the civil war and Syrian occupation, but there was hope among the people for freedom and democracy of what an extraordinary country Lebanon has been. Unfortunately, these high hopes have not been materialized. The people have urgently protested the situation, calling for the reforms for nearly two years, and yet the Lebanese elite continued to drive the country toward failure. Today, as corruption and malign influence threaten total collapse, the people of Lebanon stand to lose the most. Iran has maintained a significant interference in Lebanon through terrorist proxy masquerading as a legitimate political party. The last year has shown the people of Hez Lebanon are tired of Hezbollah's influence and the rampant corruption emanating from their political class. Despite generous support from the international community, it's concerning that there's little effort to root out corruption. I was grateful to support the Hezbollah International Financing Prevention Act and its amendments to curtail Hezbollah destabilizing activity. Last Congress, I introduced the Hezbollah Money Laundering Prevention Act, which builds on current sanctions and determines whether areas under Hezbollah control are havens for money laundering. Providing more resources to Hezbollah and the brutal Assad regime next door will do nothing to alleviate the suffering of the Lebanese people. Until the issue of corruption is addressed, I am concerned the people of Lebanon will continue to suffer. Additionally, I am grateful that Lebanon hosts Syrian refugees of the brutal Assad regime, but I'm concerned about the reports of forced repatriation of Syrian refugees. While most of, the, most of these refugees live in extreme poverty, sadly, the reality of turning to Syria is much more dangerous. Again, I want to thank the witnesses for being here today, and I look forward to hearing from each about how the United States can help the people of Lebanon without enriching bad actors. With that, I yield back. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Wilson. I'll now introduce our distinguished witnesses. Uh, Ms. Amonia Kubin is a senior advisor on Syria, the Middle East, and North Africa at the United States Institute of Peace. Her research focuses on conflict analysis and prevention in the Middle East with a specific focus on Syria, Iraq, and Lebanon. She also served as the executive director of the congressionally mandated Syria study group from 2019 to 2020. Uh, Ms. Yakubian previously uh, served as Deputy Assistant Administrator for Middle East Bureau at USAID from 2014 to 2017, where she had responsibility for Iraq, Syria, Jordan, and Lebanon. Dr. Rhonda Slim is a senior fellow and the director of the Program on Conflict Resolution and Track 2 Dialogues at the Middle East Institute in Washington, uh, and is a non-resident fellow at the Foreign Policy Institute of the Johns Hopkins University School of Advanced International Studies. She works and publishes on regional international issues of the Middle East with an emphasis on Lebanon, Syria, and Iraq. A former vice president of the International Institute for Sustained Dialogue, Slim has also been a president, uh, a senior program, sorry, senior program advisor at the Rockefeller Brothers Fund, a guest scholar at the U.S. Institute of Peace, a program director at Resolve, Inc., and a program officer at the Kettering Foundation. And she's developed and managed a number of dialogue and peace building projects in the Middle East. And finally, Mr. David Shanker is the Cobb Senior Fellow at Washington Institute for Near East Policy. 
Uh, he's the former Assistant Secretary of State for Near Eastern Affairs from 2019 to 2021. As Assistant Secretary, he was Principal Middle East Advisor to the Secretary of State and Senior Official overseeing the, uh, the conduct of U.S. policy and diplomacy in the MENA region. Prior to joining the State Department, uh, Schenker worked at, as the uh, Ofsian Fellow and Director of the Bethan David Gadul Program on Arab Politics of the Washington Institute from 2006 to 2019, and served in the Office of the Secretary of Defense as Levant Country Director, Director the Pentagon's top policy aide on the Arab nations of the Levant from 2002 to 2006. Uh, these are distinguished witnesses that uh, we are all quite familiar with, and we're glad to, to see all of them and have them here. Thanks for being here, and I will now recognize the witnesses for five minutes each. Without objection, your prepared wit written statements will be made a part of the record. Um, Ms. Yacoubi, and you are recognized for five minutes. Thank you. Chairman Deutsch, Ranking Member Wilson, and members of the subcommittee, thank you for the opportunity to testify on the unprecedented crisis in Lebanon and the challenges posed for U.S. policy. The timing for this hearing is especially important. The lights are blinking red in Lebanon as the country hurdles toward total collapse. I've followed developments in Lebanon for several years and I'm a senior advisor at the U.S. Institute of Peace. However, the views I express here today are my own. It's difficult to overestimate the, both the gravity and urgency of the situation in Lebanon and the detrimental impact that state collapse would have on U.S. national security interests. Lebanon is in a free fall, propelled by a series of cascading crises. The catalyst for Lebanon's downward spiral began with the 2019 financial crisis, driven by mounting debt and what has been termed a Ponzi scheme economy. The COVID pandemic further compounded the crisis. Then, nearly one year ago, the devastating Beirut port blast, one of the largest non-nuclear explosions in history, killed 200 and wounded thousands. The statistics reflecting Lebanon's rapid downward spiral are staggering. The Lebanese lira has lost more than 90% of its value. Hyperinflation has set in with food prices up more than 600%. The economy contracted by 20% last year. The humanitarian impacts are also dire. More than 50% of Lebanese now live below the poverty line with 25% living in extreme poverty. The UN estimates that 75% of Lebanese families are food insecure. UNICEF warns that more than 70% of Lebanese are at immediate risk of losing access to safe water as public water systems collapse. An estimated 1.3 million Lebanese children have dropped out of school since October 2019. If unaddressed, Lebanon's cascading crises could provoke a total security breakdown, either from the top down or the bottom up. Concerns are mounting that the army will not be able to meet its soldiers' basic needs, precipitating a collapse of the one institution preventing total chaos in Lebanon. Lebanon is also threatened by a bottom-up social explosion as tensions rise and protests, riots, and even armed confrontations are becoming more commonplace. Politically, Lebanon has been at an impasse with politicians slow to act. The July 26 designation of Premier Najib Makati as Prime Minister is an important development, but it's only a first step. Makati faces a daunting set of challenges. First, he must form a cabinet. Second, that cabinet must be capable and empowered to implement deep reform. At its core, Lebanon is suffering from, is witnessing a reckoning based on decades of pervasive corruption, entrenched patronage, poor governance, and a lack of accountability. State collapse in Lebanon would have dire consequences for both regional stability and U.S. national security interests. First, when states collapse, security vacuums emerge, potentially leading to a resurgence of violent extremism. Second, the Iranian-backed militia Hezbollah is best poised to weather a total state collapse with a demonstrated capacity to rely on its own security infrastructure and social ne welfare networks. Third, state collapse could precipitate a major displacement crisis. And fourth, state failure in Lebanon holds the potential to provoke broader regional insecurity. As Lebanon's downward spiral accelerates, the U.S. should focus on four urgent priorities. One, provide additional humanitarian assistance through direct cash assistance to the most vulnerable Lebanese. Two, maintain pressure on the Lebanese political class to ensure immediate cabinet formation 
and reform implementation. The U.S. should develop coercive measures to convey the credible threat of targeted sanctions against those impeding progress on these critical steps. Three, provide additional support to the Lebanese armed forces. Potential options include a one-time tranche of cash assistance or DOD direct support to Lebanese army commissaries. And four, insist that the 2022 elections occur on time and reestablish funding for elections monitoring. Beyond these urgent steps, the U.S. should also undertake measures that bolster Lebanon's capacities and guard against entrenching aid dependency, specifically harness the expertise and financing of the Lebanese diaspora, increase USAID's education funding, expand USAID's economic growth programming. Thank you, and I'm happy to take your questions. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Ms. Yakubian. Uh, Ms. Slim, you're next. You're recognized for five minutes. Chairman Deutsch, Ranking Member Wilson, distinguished members of the subcommittee, thank you for the opportunity to testify today. Lebanon is facing the most acute economic crisis since the famine crisis of World War I. It is the result of decades of systemic corruption and mismanagement of public funds by a political class working in concert with Lebanese financial and banking officials. The economic crisis has impoverished the majority of Lebanese. The once strong Lebanese middle class is quickly vanishing. Vulnerable groups, including women, children, and refugee communities, are bearing the brunt of the deteriorating conditions. On the security front, two alarming trends are taking shape. One, security fragmentation and localization as people begin turning for security to local armed groups, be they militias, gangs, or criminal networks. And second, an expanding crime terror nexus as extremist and terrorist groups merge with networks of drug, human, and arms trafficking and cross-border smuggling. A long-lasting impact of the crisis will be on the country's human capital. Thousands of highly skilled Lebanese, including doctors, nurses, teachers, IT specialists, especially young ones, are leaving the country in droves. As we know from experiences from other post-conflict stabilization efforts, it takes decades to replenish this human capital. The economic crisis has had a mixed impact on Hezbollah. On one hand, it has forced a large portion of Lebanon's Shia to turn to Hezbollah for financial assistance, thus strengthening the hold of Hezbollah on the Shia community in Lebanon. In response to this, Hezbollah has rolled out a financial assistance and subsidy program targeting its supporters only. On the other hand, this increase in demand on Hezbollah for financial assistance is coming at a time when its finances are under stress due to a number of factors, which I discuss in some detail in my written testimony. Along with other political leaders, Hezbollah is recalculating how to maintain the status quo while managing an angry popular mood that is holding all political parties, including Hezbollah, responsible for the deteriorating economic condition and for the Beirut port blast. The image that Hezbollah spent years cultivating inside Lebanon, especially among Lebanon Shia, as a non-corrupt and non-establishment group, anti-establishment group, is no more. It's widely seen now as part and parcel of the corrupt political class that brought Lebanese to the terrible condition they find themselves in. While the U.S. cannot fix Lebanon's multiple woes, we should not walk away from the challenges Lebanon presents. However dysfunctional its democracy is, Lebanon remains one of the few Arab countries in the Middle East with relatively strong civil liberties, a free media environment, a vibrant civil society, and multi-confessional coexistence. Through Hezbollah, Iran threatens the United States, Israel, and our Arab allies and partners' interests while the rise of extremist groups like Al-Qaeda and ISIS has receded in Lebanon, thanks to strong sustained effort by the Lebanese armed forces. These gains could erode quickly amid a deteriorating economic crisis that provides recruitment opportunities for extremist groups. Russia is increasingly eyeing Lebanon as part of its expansionist strategy in the Mediterranean region. If we see ground in Lebanon, Iran and Russia will quickly fill the vacuum. Working with allies and partners in Europe and the Arab region, the United States should mobilize humanitarian assistance to mitigate the impact of the economic crisis on people's lives. 
but our decision to assist Lebanese officials to secure the assistance of the international community, including the IMF, World Bank, key countries like France, UK, Germany, Saudi Arabia, UAE, Kuwait, in developing an emergency funding package to rescue the economy, should depend primarily on the decision that the Lebanese officials and the Lebanese people make, including implementation of economic reforms. In my written testimony, I discuss four areas for U.S. engagement, working with allies and partners in Europe and the Arab region. First, mitigating economic hardships by scaling up existing aid programs to Lebanese and refugee communities in the form of cash handouts, distribution of food and medicine, and provision of medical care. There is also a need for putting in place long-term sustainable and solutions focusing on self-reliance and livelihood programs. Second, working again with allies in Europe, especially France, we should lead an international diplomatic effort to put pressure on the Lebanese politician toward the formation of a cabinet of independent and competent technocrats. Third, the US, along with France again, should lead 53 Lebanese. I thank you again for your attention and I look forward to your comments and questions. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Slim. Uh, we appreciate your testimony. Uh, Mr. Schenker, nice to see you. You're recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Chairman Deutsch, Ranking Member Wilson. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to testify about the crisis in Lebanon today. Nearly a year has passed since the catastrophic Beirut port explosion, which killed 200 and left 300,000 homeless. The port explosion reflected the longstanding disregard of Lebanon's political elite for the well-being. So it was a coup de grace. Support for, uh, for FMF. Uh, collaboration is, is problematic and needs to be addressed. Washington needs to hold the LAF to a high standard. Uh, the Biden administration should engage in a process of leveraging U.S. funding to weed out the most senior officers loyal to Hezbollah in the LAF. Uh, the Biden administration also should likewise condition assistance on the LAF, uh, ending its obscene practice of employing military tribunals to target Hezbollah's critics at home and abroad, including uh, 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 my uh I've been to Lebanon. I've followed Lebanon for well over 40 years. I was there in the 80s when things were pretty dire. Uh, and here we are 40 years later and things are even worse. Let me begin by asking uh, perhaps uh, Ms. Yakubi and then others could comment. Just is the logic of a country, Lebanon, in fact, really a false premise that, that there, there really is no uh, country to be had, that the logic of a Lebanon as such does not exist, that the, uh, the sectional and communal differences and disputes are so fundamental that we're never going to put it back together again as a sovereign independent state that functions as a state. The corruption, the, uh, the, the evasion of normal economic responsibilities like taxation are so ingrained. The differences now so sharpened and acute that putting it all back together as one really is, a, is just you know, a false hope. And to, and, and to Mr. Shanker, I, I just say I am old enough to remember when we had to try to rebuild the Lebanese armed forces and it fell apart along sectoral lines. Um, and I'd be interested in your observations as well. I mean, has something changed that we now have some inner cohesion that will keep the Lebanese armed forces together so that it remain, it, it is a unifying protective force? Uh, or is that at risk as well? I'd be interested maybe to start with you, Ms. Yakubian, on your, your reaction. And I'm not trying to say, let's just give up on Lebanon, but I, I, I almost despair uh, as to what the solutions are to try to put Humpty Dumpty back together again. Thank you, Congressman, for your question. And I certainly understand your despair and in many ways share it. Um, it it's not lost, I think, on many of us that Lebanon, the 100th anniversary of Lebanon's creation was last year. And I think even then questions were being raised. Um, but that being said, first, I guess I would respond by saying it's not on us. It's not on the US. 
to rebuild and fix Lebanon. Uh, it's for the Lebanese to do. The, the depth of, of your despair is understandable, but that said, as the daughter of Lebanese immigrants, there was a time in Lebanon, uh, in the 50s, in the 60s, in the 70s, prior to the Civil War, where it truly was a multi-confessional model for the region. Um, it suffers enormous issues around governance and corruption that we've, that we've laid out. Uh, but it's certainly not the only country in the region, and I allude to this in my testimony. This is a region-wide set of challenges that need to be addressed. I don't think we can afford to walk away from Lebanon. I don't think we should give up in despair and believe that this idea is no longer viable. You see it in the energy of many of the Lebanese people. You see it in their, in their entrepreneurial spirit. Even with, and, and the, frankly, the storied Lebanese resilience, which has now been tested beyond, frankly, any resilience. So I maintain hope that this is indeed a country that exists not only as an idea, but that can in reality, but the Lebanese people are deserving of a better system of governance. They are trying, I believe, their best to bring it about. We need to look at our policies and, and our assistance programming and make sure that we are not insist, you know, entrenching some of the more uh, 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 sort of negative trends of the country and that we, are, we, will, we work to help the Lebanese themselves to build back uh, the country that they deserve. Thank you. Thank you, Representative Connolly. Um, it's a good question about uh, whether this is an institution that is built uh, to withstand the, te the test of time. We all do, do remember what happened during the Civil War and the uh, splitting of the military along uh, sectarian fissures. Um, when I was in the Department of Defense in 2005, uh, at the time, Lebanon was receiving about $1.5 million a year, all in IMET. Uh, and when the people of Lebanon stood up um, and threw the Syrians out and ended the decades-long occupation, uh, we decided to back the institution uh, to the tune of something like $70 million a year. Now it's up to something like $120 million a year. Um, the, the idea there was to build um, a bit of an institution that had broader range capabilities, mostly in terms of uh, border security and domestic security. Uh, this was never intended, obviously, to take on Hezbollah or take on... Um, controversial missions that would uh, test uh, sectarian um, uh, ability to withstand sectarian pressures. Um, I think we have to have fairly low expectations for the LAF um, and hope it stays together um, to do this type of public security mission uh, domestically. Uh, uh, if Lebanon is ever going to have a future, uh, the LAF is going to have to be an institution that works. Um, as we know, almost no institution works in Lebanon. So um, uh, I am not uh, incredibly hopeful, but um, I, th I think it's worth a shot. Uh, uh, Mr. Connolly, your time has expired. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. All right. Thank you very much, Mr. Connolly. Uh, Mr. Wilson, the ranking member, uh, is recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Chairman Deutsch. And uh, again, amazingly enough, I agree with uh, President Congressman uh, Connolly, Jerry Connolly. Uh, and it, it is sad about the uh, gloom and also uh, the despair. Uh, and, uh, and I look forward to working in a bipartisan way as we try to assist. Additionally, it's particularly sad for me because uh, I grew up in South Carolina where the uh, Syrian Lebanese community uh, assimilated so well. I mean, the leaders in business, leaders in government, um, uh, just uh, phenomenally successful. Uh, and, uh, and so it's particularly sad that, um, as uh, Ms. Yacoubian has pointed out, uh, how entrepreneurial, successful. Uh, and of course, I've been to Beirut and to see what it could be, what it has been, the uh, Paris, the Middle East. But, um, and also, I have another personal connection. One of my former staff members uh, actually lived uh, adjacent to uh, the port and her uh, condominium was destroyed. Uh, thank goodness that afternoon uh, she called me, let me know that she had um, not been present, uh, but it would have been catastrophic otherwise. Bottom line is um, the people of America do care about the people of uh, Lebanon and want the best. Uh, with that in mind, um, Secretary Schenker, what levers did, does the United States have 
to disincentivize further corruption in, uh, by the elites of Lebanon? Which specific types of sanctions or others might be most effective? Uh, thank you, Ranking Member Wilson. Um, well, when I was in the administration, um, we implemented a series of global Magnitsky sanctions against corrupt Lebanese politicians. Um, uh, the president's son-in-law, Gibran Basile, um, Yosef Fignanos, uh, Ali Hassan Khalil. Um, this was across, this is a, a cross sect, uh, not um, uh, Christian, Sunni, Shia. Um, I think that these are effective measures. Um, nobody wants to be branded um, uh, corrupt. Um, of course, um, in Lebanon, these people are widely known to be corrupt, uh, trucking with Hezbollah and aiding and abetting uh, this broken system, but um, to have it spelled out on a piece of paper, the, the bigger issue, um, and to make these more effective, um, uh, you know, I think that we really need to get the Europeans on board. And this has been a real problem, um, France in particular. Um, you know, uh, a lot of these uh, political elite in Lebanon uh, enjoy their time in, in Paris, have bank accounts there. When we designate for corruption, um, it's a largely symbolic measure, um, but uh, it, it's a lot more impactful um, should it uh, come from uh, France or the European Union. Um, they, uh, the, these, uh, the EU and France have said that sanctions are coming, uh, but we have not yet seen, uh, seen any enacted. Hey, well, thank you for your leadership in regard to the Magnitsky Act, and uh, more, more Americans need to know how effective and uh, the achievements of, of what you did. And Dr. Slim, uh, you noted Lebanese's uh, level of corruption. How does the corruption manifest? How do the political elites use their positions to skim money for their own benefit? Thank you, Ranking Member uh, Wilson. Uh, the way the system has been set is, and especially since the end of the Civil War in 1990 and the Taif Agreement, is that all positions uh, at the cabinet level, at the sub-cabinet levels, are divided among the different parties. And, and, and all kind of public contracting is done according to a certain you know, formula of dividing these, this, this public money among these different parties by, by, through pu procuring public contracts uh, to them. And, and, and it's also a system whereby political posts and political, you know, are, are divided among political parties. And so even bureaucrats uh, need to show loyalties to the political party because they owe their, uh, you know, appointments and their positions to these parties. Uh, the question I would like to add to what my colleagues have just said, whether it is, you know, a hopeless situation. I would like to say that the Lebanese themselves have been trying to change the system. It's economy, it's the political economy underpinning it, the political structure itself. Since now 2005, we have seen a rising in 2005, we have seen a rising in 2015, we have seen a rising in 2019. And every time with every uprising, they don't upend the status quo, but they, 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 you know, deal a dent in the architecture of this political system and this political economy. And so it's a long term project, but the Lebanese themselves are committed to this process of upending a status quo that has now brought them to the, you know, catastrophe that they are experiencing today. And thank you. And indeed, we need to also address Hezbollah and the rockets that they have threatening uh, Israel, 100,000 rockets, Iranian provided, but that would be another issue that I'm Congress, that I'm confident that Chairman Deutsch is going to approach, okay? I just know he'll do it. I yield back. I thank the ranking member, and I, uh, I thank you for putting that trust in me. Uh, Mr. Cicilline, you're recognized for five minutes. Trust the entire committee shares, Mr. Chairman. Thank um, thank you so much for, for holding this hearing, uh, Chairman Deutsch and Ranking Member Wilson. It comes, obviously, at a really important time, and uh, thank you to our witnesses. Uh, this testimony is, of course, very sobering, and we, I think we all feel a little despondent when you think about the persistent lack of governance, the rampant corruption, the gross mismanagement that have made uh, uh, Lebanon's difficulties even uh, greater. And, uh, you know, the, the engagement by the United Nations, the World Bank, the EU, um, don't seem to have uh, made much progress. But I guess my first question is really related to the 
Lebanese Armed Forces, the LAF. Uh, you know, this relationship between the LAF and the United States goes back a very long time. Um, and, you know, obviously in light of the powerful role of Hezbollah, the Lebanese Armed Forces is, has been an important counterweight. And so I, my first question is really, what is your assessment about the LEF's capacity today, the real risk that it could collapse? Is it currently in a position to fulfill border security and counterterrorism functions, particularly to root out, you know, ISIS militants at the border? So kind of what is the realistic prospect it collapses? And if, if it survives, is it able to provide perform the kind of functions that are so necessary to some semblance of stability and some kind of way to Hezbollah? I don't know, Mr. Schenger, do you want to start or? Uh, yes, thank, thank you, Representative uh, Cicilline. Um, well, first, let me say, I, I, I don't believe Hezbollah is a, uh, sorry, I don't believe the LAF is a counterweight to Hezbollah. Um, certainly, it is a, a more positive force. Uh, but, but for uh, reasons that we talked about earlier, um, it does nothing to oppose Hezbollah. And in fact, um, acts oftentimes uh, periodically, um, uh, 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 I think, uh, deconflicts de with Hezbollah, uh, protects them in a way, uh, prevents uh, UNIFIL in the south from getting to locations after rockets are fired to protect Hezbollah. Um, that said, um, they are capable um, in terms of domestic counterterrorism mission. They have a high level capability, according to CENTCOM. Um, they uh, increasingly are doing some work in, in certain areas that are not controlled by Hezbollah um, uh, on the border, um, primarily with Syria um, and not with Israel. Um, as for the collapse, um, you know, when you have your standard non-commissioned officer who is making $800 a month now, and that is less than, you know, worth less than $70 or so, um, you're starting to see some defections, people going home, uh, trying to figure out other ways to support their families. The LAF has not served meat um, to their conscripts in some time. Uh, the Qatar is donating 80, 80 tons a month of food uh, to the LAF. Um, I think that, uh, you know, it's shaking um, uh, and there's a, a great deal of concern. Um, that said, I, I do think, um, uh, you know, funds from the United States, other donors uh, in the Arab world, um, will um, prevent this from bottoming out anytime soon, but uh, it's not a great trajectory. Um, they need a government uh, and they need to turn things around and take these deep type of reforms. It's also important ultimately that uh, the LAF root out um, the, the elements of Hezbollah that are within the force. Can I just ask you my minute and a half that's remaining uh, each of the witnesses, what is one thing Congress should do that would help set the table for a long-term political and economic recovery from Lebanon. Like what, you know, we hear this narrative, which is very depressing in a lot of ways, but what actions can we take that raise the hope that, that there will be some long-term political and economic solution in Lebanon? Ms. Yakobian, maybe we can start yeah, with you. I'm happy. Thank you, Congressman. I'm happy to jump in. I think, I think two things. One, I think the Congress should act immediately to address the humanitarian suffering of the Lebanese people. This could lead to this bottom-up uh, uh, social implosion that I referenced. And number two, I think the Congress should keep the pressure on Lebanon's political class, because ultimately there's going to be no rescue of Lebanon until there is a credible government in place that is willing to implement the reforms that have been on the table for years. Uh, those are the two key measures I would recommend. Son? Yes, I, I agree with Ms. Yakubian. And I think the one important thing that Congress needs to do is, in fact, two things. One is to sustain pressure on the US administration <laughs> to pay attention to Lebanon. I think there are too many priorities now for the US administration. And Lebanon can fall by the wayside. But second, I think this public call by Congress, continuous public call by Congress and pressure on the administration to put in place an international investigation of the court blast. 
one year since the blast, the local investigation, the government-led investigation, has yielded no results. And we and many civil society groups see this committee, an international committee that gets to the bottom, you know, of the of, of what happened, who was responsible, which officials are you know, are uh, committed criminal negligence, is really a first step to ending corruption and holding officials accountable and ending impunity in Lebanon. Thank you so much. My time has expired. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, for the indulgence. Mr. Cicilline, Mr. Kinzinger, you're recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thanks to our witnesses for uh, being here. Um, let me just ask. So I was actually in Lebanon, I guess, a couple of years ago now. Time flies through COVID. Um, went, you know, was able to get to the uh, blue line with the UN, with the UN Foundation. Obviously saw the, you know, how, how difficult and challenging all that is. And you see how much Hezbollah is integrated in daily society. Let me just ask, and so, you know, I, I think that brings to light the importance of the Lebanese Armed Forces, as Mr. Cicilline was talking about. So to follow up on his questions, who benefits, uh, I'll ask, start with Mr. Shanker, who benefits from a weakened Lebanese Armed Forces? Who's the, who's the beneficiary of that? Thank you, Representative Kinsinger. Um, well, certainly, uh, certainly Hezbollah um, benefits. Um, if the LAF is weak, uh, accedes to all Hezbollah demands, uh, prevents um, UNIFIL um, from getting to locations, um, establishes these areas called Green Without Borders, where the LAF are, it's basically a no-go no zone, a no-go Hezbollah military zone. Um, they benefit, Hezbollah benefits from that. There, there's, there's no doubt. And, and let me ask you, too, I'll, I'll stay with you. So even before the Lebanese government collapsed. We knew that there was dire need for economic and political reforms. The IMF bailout requires many of these reforms to be addressed before billions of dollars can be infused into the economy. In your opinion, what are the most important reforms that are needed to improve the uh, situation in Lebanon and the lives of the people there? Goodness, uh, well, they have, um, uh, it's a good question. Um, I think we've written quite a bit about this. Um, you know, the economic, uh, the, the, Energy sector in Lebanon is um, incredibly corrupt, um, uh, dysfunctional. Um, I think the banking sector <laughs> is uh, is also um, you know the regula regulatory problems. Um, uh, uh, they've run amok. Um, uh, the lack of transparency with the central bank uh, it's been an endemic problem as well. Um, you can go across the board. Um, the Ministry of Health, uh, there, you know, there's no. There's no public records on, on how the money is spent. It, it, it disappears. So um, it, it's across uh, all sectors, really. Do you feel like the kind of the, the biggest, I guess, linchpin is just really when it comes down to it, corruption or a desire to cover it up, I guess? Yes. Um, I think Transparency International places it, you know, uh, in the last 25 in the world, you know, the bottom um, you know, 157th out of 180 or something like this. It's incredibly corrupt. And as I said earlier, uh, it, it, this is not just Hezbollah who, who benefits from this corrupt system. It's, uh, you know, all political elites um, to a greater or lesser extent. And let me just ask, this will be my last question. I'll stick with you too. Uh, without serious reforms or direct economic relief, do you think the current crisis in Lebanon impacts the potential for war between Hezbollah and Israel? Uh, no, I don't. I, I think you get uh, you know massive uh, migration um, uh, that uh, uh, Representative Deutsch um, spoke spoke about earlier. I think that you will get a flight. Anybody who can will get out. Um, you will see the country emptying out of its Christian population. Uh, but I think anybody who's got the means will get on a boat and go to Europe. Hezbollah, um, I don't think right now wants to push for a war. Things are bad enough. Um, you know, possibly they would want to do so to change the subject, but I think that, uh, you know, in this lo lowering tide, uh, the Hezbollah boat still floats higher than, than all the rest. Good analogy. So, well, thanks to all the witnesses and, uh, Mr. Chairman, I'll yield back to you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Kinzinger, uh, vice chair Manning, you're recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chair, for holding this very important hearing. And I will agree with. My colleagues, this is a, a distressing um, and rather depressing. Uh, uh, the information that we're getting is, is even more depressing than I would have anticipated. I wanna pick up on 
uh, Ranking Member Wilson's suggested question, because I was in Israel in July of 2006 when Hezbollah started firing rockets um, on Israel. And uh, one of the most distressing parts about that attack was that the biggest price that was paid was by uh, Lebanese children and families because Hezbollah had their rocket launchers in the middle of homes and villages. Um, so it's not just the Israelis who are at risk, it's the civilian, it's the Lebanese civilian populations. So I wonder if anybody can comment on what can be done to deal with the 100,000 rockets that Hezbollah has pointed at Israel. And our um, most recent understanding is that the Iranians are helping helping Hezbollah upgrade the, the precision of those rockets. Uh, what can be done? And um, has there been, um, has attitude, has the attitude of the Lebanese people toward uh, Hezbollah shifted at all? I, and I open that question, um, uh, Mr. Shanker, you were talking about the missile, so I'll turn it to you if, you, if you'd like to take the question. Well, sure. Listen, uh, the, thank you very much, uh, Vice Chair Manning. Uh, I agree with you. I think the, the precision guided missile, missile project, the PGM upgrade project that Hezbollah is doing, um, Israel has defined that as a red line. Um, this is basically to make what are 150,000 dumb rockets and missiles into uh, very smart and accurate uh, missiles. And uh, this is a, a strategic um, threat to Israel. This, this is not only um, uh, you know, Israel's energy, desal, um, uh, but also runways at, uh, at air bases, et cetera, uh, very dangerous. Um, listen, what I tried to do when I was in the administration was to uh, strengthen the mandate of UNIFIL. Um, if they're not going to do the job, which was to prevent Hezbollah from rearming after 2006, well, why do there have to be 15,000 or 10,000 of them? I think there should be less or they should actually work to implement their mandate and that the government of Lebanon should be held responsible if it's not going to um, either encourage them to, to uh, pursue their mandate, um, the LAF has to be held to a high standard on that as well. We have to call them out and read these reports and talk about what the LAF and what the government of Lebanon is and is not doing. Um, sanctions, of course, um, but also um, legislation that has been worked on on the Hill on human shields. I think that this is you know, helpful as well to hold uh, um, Hezbollah or Hezbollah uh, allies in Lebanon responsible um, for the, uh, the, the the placing of these munitions in um, among civilian populations, and indeed in the in the basements of uh, of apartment buildings, it's incredibly dangerous. But in light of the meltdown we've just discussed, uh, is there any hope that that the LAF could actually would be willing to to go after uh, Hezbollah on these issues? No, no hope whatsoever. Are there any other alternatives? I, I think that the, the well, I think that the whole international community has to get beyond behind a uh, a, a common understanding of what Hezbollah is. Um, this this would entail a, uh, a you know a uh, uh, an EU um, designation of uh, an ending this fiction of a political wing versus a military wing of Hezbollah. Um, this impedes um, and makes it more difficult uh, the sanctioning of uh, Hezbollah fundraising. Um, and, uh, and other efforts in Europe. Um, I, I think that uh, the first step would be to delegitimate the organization. Thank you. Uh, I wanna to turn to the refugee crisis. Ms. Yakubian, um, we've, we've talked a little bit about the over a million Syrian refugees uh, who have been in Lebanon since 2011 and the pressure that they have placed on Lebanese public services and host communities. Um, is there anything that, that can be done to help lift the burden uh, of the refugees uh, on, on Lebanon and also to, to help the refugees themselves? Thank you, Representative Manning. And thank you for raising that very important question because I do think often we don't always remember that Lebanon hosts the largest number of refugees per capita in the world. It is actually providing an important international public good in doing so. Um, unfortunately, what we've seen is as the economic situation has spiraled downward, the situation for Syrian refugees is particularly dire, uh, that more than 90% live in extreme poverty. 
there's growing concern about tensions between Lebanese host communities and Syrian refugees. There's worry not only about a displacement crisis, but maybe even forcible return of refugees back to Syria. So what to do? I mean, I think it's important, number one, to ensure that we continue to provide and that the international community provides enough assistance through UNHCR for Syrian refugees. Unfortunately, as the conflict has now entered its 10th year, or its 11th year, actually, we're seeing donor fatigue as a real issue. So one is to up the funding for uh, Syrian refugees. Two is to go back to what I said, though, which is we also need to provide funding for the increasing numbers of vulnerable Lebanese. And when I say we, I mean the collective we. Uh, I mean the international community. President Macron is hosting a conference on August 4. I think it's essential that the international community step in because what we are seeing is also a growing concern that as the Lebanese become more impoverished, more, uh, more uh, despairing of their own situation, they will continue and they will deepen and turn their anger on Syrian refugees. This is a real issue that uh, aid providers have to be aware of, the political economy of assistance. So we have to make sure that both the Syrian refugees and the vulnerable Lebanese populations are being cared for. Thank you. My time has long expired. I yield back. Uh, thank you, Vice Chair Manning. Uh, Ms. Bur uh, Mr. Burchett, sorry, you're recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I appreciate the excellent manner in which you run this meeting. And also, um, I, I uh, am often complimenting you, much to the dismay of several members of your, your party and to almost everyone in my party. So I'm glad to call you my friend, brother. Thank you for all of that, Mr. Burchett. You're recognized. Sir, feel free to use that in a campaign ad. Um, Lebanon has been w without formal government for almost a year. Um, has Hezbollah taken advantage of this circumstance to increase their influence within the country? And if so, how? If any of the panelists would care to answer that, please. Uh, Representative Burchett, thank you for the question. I think Hezbollah has been now engaging in this balancing act, you know, for some time inside the country. They have the military arsenal, unlike the other political parties, to be able to impose their will when they think government decisions are not going their way or when they want government decisions to be made to go their way. And But at the same time, there are limits to how far they can go without upsetting the status quo, which is very much now in their favor. I mean, they have been, they started as a party that is anti-establishment, anti-political system. And since 2005, when they joined the cabinet, they have become the protector, the defender of the political status quo. And then the relationship that they have now with the president of the Republic, General Michel Aoun, uh, is, is, is a relationship that is very much beneficial to Hezbollah and, and they don't see, they don't want to end that. And so I think they already have the kind of power they can, you know, they need to, to maintain the status quo, to maintain the paramilitary status they have. But at the same time, they don't, they don't want to use that to upset or upend the status quo. Thank you. Uh in the rest of the palace, in the wake of the Beirut uh, port explosion, the Lebanese people took to the streets to protest against Hezbollah and even against Hassan Nasrallah himself. Is there still any anger against Hezbollah in regards to the blast? Uh, Representative uh, Burchett, um, uh, I believe that there is still um, a great deal of, of anger um, toward Hezbollah for the blast. Um, while there there hasn't been any um, uh, you know definitive uh, results of investigation that have, have come out either from from Lebanon or the the, the U.S. role in uh, providing support for an investigation, none of this has been made public. Uh, there have been um, some Lebanese, uh, including uh, uh, Lokman Slim, who uh, who had said that actually um, Hezbollah was siphoning off some of this ammonium nitrate to provide it to Syria to use for dropping barrel bombs on the Lebanese people during the civil war. Um, none of this uh, was ever validated, but uh, uh, Lokman Slim was assassinated most likely, most likely by Hezbollah in, in 
February 2021. I think that there still is a much a lot of popular anger against Hezbollah. Also, the fact that Hezbollah, which has more largesse, maybe money is coming in from either narco trafficking or um, illegal entrepreneurship or just from Iran, uh, that it's able to help um, its Shia constituents. Um, and uh, the, there's a, an, an issue of relative deprivation um, that, once again, uh, some of these Shiites can go and get subsidized goods in grocery stores, um, and the rest of the Lebanese population has seen its savings wiped out and uh, nobody to care for them. All right, thank you. Mr. Chairman, how much time do I have left? You, you have uh, just over a minute, Mr. Brooks. Okay. Real quickly. Um, the 1932 National Pact divided the Lebanese government positions based on the three most popular religions, uh, the Maronite uh, Catholics, the Sunni Muslims, and Shia Muslims, with a population of Muslims significantly larger than what it was at that time, um, now even larger than the current Christian population. Is there any appetite for a change to the government structure among the Lebanese people? I don't know if one of my, my colleagues would want to answer that. Uh, I, I think that... Um... Uh, depends who you ask. Um, right now, we see uh, Hezbollah looking at this and saying that they want to divide uh, divide the parliament into thirds and, and revisit uh, potentially the national pact um, or the Taif Accords um, uh, about power sharing and the nature of the power sharing. Uh, the system is incredibly problematic as is, uh, but uh, protects um, uh, an element of uh, the Christian community that uh, that is much less than it was. Um, I think. I think, we lost, um, I think we lost him, Mr. It, Chairman. It, yeah, it appears Mr. Schenker is having some uh, technical difficulty, so we'll try to get that worked out. And uh, Mr. Bridget, that um, that's time my time. So, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Excellent clock management on your part. <laughs> thank you very much, uh, Mr. Keating. You're recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. According to recent reports, the UK plans to cut its programming uh, in Lebanon entirely. Uh, among other bilateral cuts, it's fair to say, uh, across the globe that they're doing. These cuts are likely to hit many parts of the world hard, but where's the British assistance in Lebanon focused? What's the impact, do you think, uh, that these cuts will have in Lebanon? And should we be concerned uh, about how to mitigate uh, that damage should it occur? Uh, Congressman, I'm happy to take an initial stab, but I want to tell you off uh, right off the bat, I'm not deeply familiar with the specifics of the British uh, assistance portfolio in Lebanon, other than to say, uh, you know, I know that they've played, I believe, an important role in the education sector, which I've also highlighted in my testimony um, as being, frankly, critical to building back Lebanese capacities. Um, this is a, I mean, I do think we are seeing the country transform before our eyes from what was once a solidly middle income, fairly well educated population to an impoverished population suffering from brain drain, as my colleague Rhonda Sleem noted eloquently. Um, and so I think any pullback of bilateral assistance from our allies at a time when the country is suffering and quite, quite frankly in need of more not less assistance particularly though assistance that's channeled not through the lebanese government but actually goes to directly so the education assistance for example can often go through ngos to the schools uh, themselves and so i think any pullback from any of our allies at this time is um, inopportune to say to say the least and, and a second question i had it's uh it might be difficult. It's one of perception, uh, so it's it's a little. But it's I think it's important to to bring up. Uh, you know, it was just November the uh, OFAC sanctioned uh, Gibran Basile for corruption uh, under Magnitsky uh, authorities, and and the, the these sanctions are well deserved and overdue. But uh, I've I've come to understand that in Lebanon, some of that is viewed as just anti Hezbollah and not dealing with corruption. Uh, and it's hard to ask a perception question though, but is it getting through that our actions are really based on, you know, the anti-corruption and dealing with that? Is that getting through with actions like this? I'll take an initial stab, Congressman. I think it's an excellent question. 
Look, I think it's important to note that the Lebanese themselves have a phrase, had a phrase throughout their protest, which was in Arabic, kullun yani kullun, meaning all of them means all of them. And so from the Lebanese uh, popular perspective, corruption is something that is pervasive across the board. Uh, and so from my perspective, I think those, those sanctions were important, but I actually think that the threat of sanctions should really reach across the political spectrum in Lebanon, frankly, to include even our allies uh, who may be tarnished by corruption, if those sanctions are to really maintain their importance and their signaling as being truly anti-corruption, as opposed to being, trying to go after particular adversaries. Uh, I think that's people. an important uh, distinction too. So thank, thank you for bringing it up. I don't, I don't have a clock on me, so. Last thing I'm going to ask, if there's time, is uh, in terms of uh, the essential relief and aid that we're giving, I don't think in the hearing, I might have missed part of it, uh, how has the COVID pandemic affected that? There is, there, is recent, there is now a new wave of, um, of COVID again. There is a surge because of the Delta variant. But uh, Lebanon has been undertaking an effective vaccination program, thanks to, you know, uh, uh, vaccines the, through from the United States through COVAX, and uh, however, I think there is a race between the rate of vaccination versus the rate of infections. And so, after for a while, there was a decrease in the rate of new infection and the hospitalization. Now we are seeing a sudden surge in that, and it's happening at a time when the hospital system, you know, is under major stress because of a number of factors. Okay, I yield back, Mr. Chairman. Thank you all. Uh, thank you, Mr. Keating. Mr. Stubbe, you're recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, according to the State Department in fiscal year 2020, the United States provided 216 million in combined State Department and DOD military aid to Lebanon. These funds are to help counter Syrian and Iranian influence. However, there are concerns about assistance to the Lebanese armed forces being diverted to Hezbollah and other designated terrorist organizations. And as I mentioned earlier in this hearing, Hezbollah does in fact benefit. Lebanon's economic crisis is ranked in the top 10 most severe crises globally since the past few decades. Past U.S. administrations have criticized the decades of mismanagement, corruption, and failure of Lebanese leaders. Lebanon is changing by the day. Political groups are taking advantage of the crisis. The rich are getting richer and the poor are getting poorer. Uh, my questions are from Mr. Shanker. Do you know how the allocation of U.S. taxpayer assistance in Lebanon is handled with the lack of transparency and corruption there? And what safeguards are put in place to ensure access is based on need rather than on political and sectarian affiliation? Uh, thank you, Representative Stubbe. Um, well, the, the money is channeled through FMF. Uh, the 120 million this year, 115 million, uh, will be channeled through FMF, which is the purchase of uh, US military equipment, um, ammunition, uniforms, uh, and things of the like. Um, Lebanon, uh, I think it's worth noting again and again, um, has one of the best uh, records um, in terms of uh, equipment not going missing. Um, we have allies in the region, I will not name them, uh, but periodically we'll lose uh, night vision goggles. Um, that doesn't happen um, in Lebanon. Uh, rifles don't go missing when, we, when there's a sniper rifle and somebody gets killed in Israel uh, with a sniper rifle, um, we go and see where that sniper, sniper rifle is. Um, so uh, the, the care for uh, this equipment, uh, it's not leaking um, to Hezbollah. Uh, there are other funds uh, that have been dispersed from DOD, um, including reimbursement for work on, uh, on border security um, with Syria, um, I believe, and, uh, and this, uh, is channeled uh, based on uh, on funds and, and receipts that are provided, et cetera, typically. Um, so I don't see funds um, disappearing through Hezbollah. Now, there may be um, tangential benefits that Hezbollah has. Uh, for example, um, let's say Unifil operates in the south. Um, the LAF is present. They are uh, buying uh, food, perhaps, from, uh, from uh, locals who are supporters of Hezbollah, Unifil, is operating in the south and hiring people um, who may be uh, constituents of Hezbollah um, uh, to do uh, jobs for them on their on their outposts. 
Um, but I don't see, uh, you know, large scale funding or even small scale funding, U.S. funding for the LAF disappearing into the hands of Hezbollah. Like the concerns many of us have regarding assistance going into the Gaza Strip with Hamas in power, the U.S. legal framework designates Hezbollah as a terrorist organization. Since Hezbollah is part of Lebanon's government, how closely are we following the legal framework with that assistance? You kind of hit on that, but obviously I have concerns, my constituents have concerns about that money getting into Hezbollah's hands. Yeah, well, the, we can uh, ask Moni Akubian a little bit, having worked at USAID. But traditionally, we've not worked with ministries uh, that have been dominated by Hezbollah. Um, and, uh, and now we're really not doing work in terms of the humanitarian uh, with the government of Lebanon, because we do not consider the government of Lebanon to be a good steward um, of U.S. taxpayer dollars. They are, they are corrupt and they're inefficient. Um, and uh, do not clearly have the, the, the interests of Lebanese people um, as a priority. Well, thank you for your time today. I yield back, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Stubbe. Mr. Vargas, you're recognized for five minutes. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, for holding this very important meeting. I want to especially thank the witnesses today for their valuable testimony. Um, I did have the opportunity to travel with uh, Chairman Issa back in 2017 to Lebanon, uh, both to Beirut and the Beka Valley. In fact, in the Beka Valley, was able to see some of the refugee camps uh, that are there. Um, so when you said that it is the country that ha holds the most refugees, I, I got to see that firsthand. Um, also got to see that there was a great, uh, certainly people we met, that, great love for the United States. Also, interestingly, I represent the California-Mexico border, the entire border, and a lot of people are not familiar with this, but a lot of Lebanese um, Mexicans uh, moved to Lebanon in early 1900s when they were still under the Ottoman Empire. In fact, did very, very well in Mexico. Carlos Slim, that at one point was the wealthiest person in the world, is of Lebanese origins in Mexican, of course. Now in of course, one of the great uh, movie stars of our time, Selma Hayek, is also of Lebanese descent. Um, so I was incredibly saddened by the blast that happened a year ago, thinking I knew that uh, you know Lebanon has had a lot of issues and problems, and with that blast, I thought it was going to be devastating for them. But of course, it's turned out it's been even worse than uh, than I imagined. Now, I did pay close attention to what you were saying as to what the United States could do, and. Um, one of the things that you said is keep the Biden administration engaged to make sure that we don't um, pull back. And the other one is the international investigation of the port blast. Um, I would also say that, that it seems to me that we have to do more for refugees also within the country. That's a, a big issue for the country itself. But what else would you add to that? I, I'm one that wants to, to see our country continue to help and hope that our European partners and international partners lean in and don't don't move out. Uh, what else can we do for whomever wants to handle that of the, of the, the witnesses? Well, uh, uh, thank you, um, Congressman Vargas. Um, listen, I, I think uh, as my as my colleagues have said on the panel, um, it's important to end uh, the notion of impunity that has been so dominant. Um, in Lebanon. And that's not just for the port blast. Um, that is also for the murder of people like Lokman Slim um, in Lebanon um, to make sure that uh, there are not only investigations um, with, uh, with uh, public findings, but also that, that uh, the people responsible are, are brought to justice. And um, for this to happen, particularly in the international cases, um, there's, we're going to have to get our European partners on board. Um, uh, you know, unilateral pressure is going to be uh, insufficient. It, it, U.S. pressure is necessary, but but insufficient. Um, as I said earlier, I think the, uh, the many in Lebanon um, care a great deal more um, about um, about French uh, sanctions um, or designations, or but it's required that they they really follow through on on threat. Um, as for humanitarian assistance, by the way, I, I think. Um, we're doing a pretty good job on that in terms of um, um, our support for a World Bank social safety net program. We're now feeding something like 1.8 million Lebanese, um, you know, per month. 
Um, we are also uh, providing, you know, 37% of the World Food Program that's doing quite a bit um, in Lebanon. That may have to be expanded as the situation further deteriorates. Um, uh, but um, I think we're doing our part on that, and we should uh, work to make sure our, our partners are doing their part. Um, uh, because we still, we remain the, the largest humanitarian donor to Lebanon, as else, like elsewhere throughout the world. Before I leave, David, if you could um, tell me why aren't the French leaning into this? Why aren't the French more involved? Is it the incapacity of their own country to get involved? Why, why is that? Well, I, I think I, certainly in humanitarian terms, I think they give some money through the EU and uh, less bilaterally. Um, although it'd be nice if they could do more on, on that front, considering their historic relation with, uh, with Lebanon. Um, but uh, we've seen a lot of threats come from the, the French um, about if the Lebanese don't um, uh, you know, uh, come together and form a government that is a reform-minded government, uh, then the people, uh, according to Macron, uh, President Macron, the people that are responsible for that, that are obstructing um, reform in Lebanon and, and uh, uh, are engaged in corruption would be sanctioned. And President Macron said that a year ago when he visited Lebanon right after the port blast, and we haven't seen that yet. Um, now, I hope that's that's coming soon, uh, but this is really important. And so I, I in, uh, in your engagements, um, in the administration's engagements, I, I think we all have to be on the same page here to get the Europeans to put their money where their mouth is. Thank you very much. My time has expired again. I thank the chairman. Thank the witnesses. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Vargas. Mr. Schneider, you're recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I appreciate uh, you having this uh, hearing and, and I'm grateful for the witnesses uh, for uh, joining us today and uh, sharing your, your thoughts. Um, you know, we, over the course of the hearing, uh, I'll share what others have said and talking about the gloominess of, of what we're hearing about from Lebanon. Uh, uh, this, uh, you, could be, and you talked about the need for Lebanon uh, to be a priority. I, I think we can all agree on that, but one of the challenges, and I said this long, I talked about it with my kids when they were young, the last thing you wanna be is the sixth priority item on a five item list. And in the Middle East, there are so many priorities, whether it's making sure Iran never gets a nuclear weapon, Syria, Yemen, you can run down the list. Why is it so important for Lebanon to be on that top five list, if you will? Thank you, Congressman. I think because as I laid out in my statement and in greater detail in my uh, testimony, written testimony, I don't think the US can afford the damage to our own national security interests that would incur in the event of total state collapse in Lebanon. Your point is absolutely well taken about bandwidth and frankly about a U.S. that at this point is really more interested, I think, in, in uh, lowering the priority and the profile of our engagements in the Middle East. But I think, and I'm grateful for this hearing because I think, as I've noted, uh, the, the, the lights are really flashing red in Lebanon. And I think the implications of state failure in Lebanon uh, cannot be contained. They, they have enormous, they will have enormous impacts uh, I think, for example, uh, the possibility of a massive displacement crisis, not unlike what we saw in 2015, should not be totally discounted, given the large number of refugees and now vulnerable Lebanese. I think the issues around how Hezbollah, and this, the, many of the questions in the hearing today have focused on Hezbollah. As I've noted, I believe Hezbollah is best poised to weather state collapse. It will emerge from state collapse in a perhaps stronger position. Um, and let me just, for, for sake of time, because we could spend hours on this, this whole issue, but you, you all talked about relieving humanitarian suffering uh, in Lebanon, but in the context of the overwhelming corruption, the, the organized crime on the rise and Hezbollah, how do we make sure that we are providing that humanitarian assistance without providing unintended support for Hezbollah corrupted political elites and, and crime syndicates? I think the answer is by, by bypassing the Lebanese government and providing that humanitarian aid directly to the Lebanese people. Uh, there are mechanisms that have been developed in which, uh, and I have, a, I have a, a little prop here, but there's, there, we have a long history of, of providing 
uh, cash assistance to Syrian refugees. This is something we've now perfected. Um, there are others, UNICEF and others, who are looking at using this exact type of mechanism through cash cards to provide the assistance directly to the most vulnerable. They maintain their agency, it's far more efficient, um, and their dignity is also maintained. Uh, Ms. Slim, do you wanna expand on that uh, from your perspective on things we might do, uh, as well as specifically targeting the polit political elites? Who are the elites and, and what's the best way to put pressure on them? Okay, in terms of political elites, I don't think that, uh, Congressman, I don't think that there is, there are good guys and bad guys. They are all bad, but they are shades of bad. And some are worse than others, you know. And unlike, I mean, Hezbollah is the only party that has the kind of military arsenal to be able to impose its will on everybody else. The others do not have that kind of military arsenal. That's the difference between Hezbollah and everybody else. But everybody else is corrupt. Everyone is corrupt. And and I, I don't think we can distinguish between bad and good guys in Lebanon. The good guys are the Lebanese people who are protesting in the streets and who are trying to upend this political system. In terms of humanitarian assistance, I think there needs to be within the international community of thinking about a different way of channeling aid to Lebanon. And uh, there are mixed records of how you do that in the international community. And, and, and there are experts now in Lebanon who are calling for the establishment of a supranational authority, you know, that is made and that is staffed by Lebanese experts known for their independence and for their competence that can answer to an advisory board made up of major donors to Lebanon. But through that international authority, all aid is channeled and all decision about how aid is administered are made by this supranational authority. Great, thank you. And I have just a second left, but it's an important issue. And maybe I can turn to uh, Dr. Tanker. You know, if Hezbollah is the worst in a spectrum of all bad, you know, the, the worst thing for vis-a-vis -vis Hezbollah is the threat of, as you mentioned, there are 150,000 uh, gum bombs uh, being converted to um, uh, sophisticated, smart, targeted weapons that could threaten Israel, uh, our most important ally in the region. And uh, are there specific things we need to be making sure that we do as just threshold actions to ensure that Hezbollah doesn't get that capacity? Uh, well, thank you, um, Representative Schneider. Uh, listen, I, I, there is no silver bullet for this problem. Um, Israel has been uh, very active in uh, going after um, either Iranian uh, missile targets or uh, weapons transfers to Hezbollah via Syria. Uh, in recent years, um, and that has been helpful. But um, I think in terms of sanctions, um, you know, you can't have Mahan Air flying into Beirut and offloading, um, you know, uh, PGM upgrade kits. Um, likewise, um, we're not going to do, uh, we're not going to be in a great position um, if we turn over a whole bunch of cash to Iran um, in the event of a renew, uh, return to the JCPOA. Uh, because this money is going to find itself right back to upgrading Hezbollah's weapon, weaponry. Um, so we have to be really careful um, about the implications of um, a cash-rich Iran and what that means for um, a, a, deter a further deterioration in the, um, in the situation between Israel and, and Hezbollah. Thank you. I've, I've long, as long as, since I've been in Congress, even before, we've worked to make sure Hezbollah doesn't get the capacity. And I look forward to work with my colleagues on this committee, on the subcommittee, on the full committee, and with the chairman's support to make sure we do all we can towards that. With that, I'm over time. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I yield back. Uh, thank you, Mr. Schneider. Uh, we are uh, fortunate to have um, Mr. Issa uh, joining us on the subcommittee today, and I will yield to you, uh, Mr. Issa, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you for yielding. Uh, as uh, Congressman Vargas said, uh, he, uh, he went with me to Lebanon on the last trip to visit specifically a number of the refugee camps. And I'm going to make the assumption that all of our witnesses would say that our continued uh, support for the stability of those camps and those personnel, over a, over a million refugees, is a separate consideration, uh, support for the UN and others, from the question of Lebanon. So unless someone disagrees with that, I'm going to change the dialogue a little bit back toward strictly the current government, including the LAF, 
and ask uh, a question of each of our guests, uh, perhaps starting with uh, Dr. Slim. Isn't it time that in coordination with other countries, we begin a true process of tough love? Uh, as a Lebanese American, as someone who still has extended family in the region, it, as I've listened to this hearing and, and now years, uh, decades since I first met with Rafiq Hariri, haven't we reached a point where, although we know that stabilizing the LAF is important, we know the contribution of AUB and, and Lebanese American University is significant uh, to stability, haven't we reached a point where Unless we confront as a global united front of donors, confront the all the sects that have systematically pillaged and raped the, the wealth of this nation, if we don't confront them in a united way, aren't we simply going to be talking again next week, next month, next year about money to stabilize the LAF in a failing nation? Thank you, Congressman Isa, for uh, the question. I totally agree that there is need to be a united front of tough love on Lebanon. And as my colleague here, Mr. Schenker, has already pointed, is that we need to have the United States, the Europeans, the Arab allies and partners come together in a concerted push, you know, to help to, uh, you know, for the formation of a effective, um, competent cabinets of independent experts with executive powers to enact reform legislation. And there need to be the threat and we need to all, you know, come together around sanctions, uh, targeting again, everybody, you know, whether through threat of sanction or and eventually through implementation of sanctions. And, and it's important that these sanctions are viewed by all of the Lebanese as targeting corruption, as trying to undermine this political economy of corruption that has been sustaining the political system and sustaining these division of spoils among few political elites and brought the country to where it is today. However, I also you know, think that the LAF remains the only national institution today that enjoys the respect of the majority of the Lebanese. It's trying to do a job in its job in very difficult situations and without any kind of political cover by the political elites. In fact, there has been pressure put on the Lebanese uh, uh, on the LAF to use force and to try to stop protests by force. And there has been, you know, some units in the LAF have have resorted to unnecessary force. But in the majority, the LAF has been really trying to maintain this balance between maintaining security, maintaining stability and also giving the space for the protesters to express their, you know, their, their demands on, in the streets without any kind of force imposed on them. Well, I appreciate that. And, and because my time is so limited and there are so many important questions, I have just one quick follow-up that I'd like to make sure I get in. Uh, under the election law that was previous in the previous election, uh, members of the diaspora, uh, even potentially me, would have a right to vote in Lebanon. There's currently a movement to stop that because of a view that foreign uh, living Lebanese might be less favorable to the establishment. Uh, should we, the United States and our partners, make the maintenance of that election law that allows for the broader in election that we had a few years ago be a contingent on any and all future support, since that's well within the power of the people, uh, the, the current leadership of Lebanon. I am a Lebanese American as well, and I'm looking forward, you know, in the future, if possible, to exercise my, role, my right to vote, if possible, uh, in, in the upcoming Lebanese elections. And I think, and there is this hope, I mean, the elections provide a pathway to introduce a new group of independent political actors from civil society who can eventually start to create a critical mass in the legislature toward reform and toward change. Now, there are different reporting of whether these elections will enable 10, 11 new faces or 20, 11 new faces, but it's better than the current status quo. And so we need, as my colleague uh, Mona said, we need to, you know, 
insist one on the elections being held on time next year. And as we know, in 2018, the elections were delayed five years before they were held. You know, they were delayed five years before 2018. And then second, we need to make sure that there is strict monitoring of the elections, you know, by international monitors. And then three, you know, funding contingent on this election held and on an elector electoral law that allows you know, these new faces, expats, to vote in the next cycle. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I yield back. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Issa. Uh, I will now uh, yield to myself to um, uh, to conclude with some questions. Uh, thanks again to all the witnesses. I, I actually want to try to focus on parties' um, interests other than the United States and Lebanon, but those there's been a lot of talk of France, um, but I, I'd like specifically to talk about um, about where uh, where our interests align with France and where they diverge. I also would like to talk about, uh, Dr. Slim, you mentioned that Russia is eyeing Lebanon for expansion. I'd like to explore that a bit further. I, I'd like to ask whether you think, whether any of you think that in part, that may have something to do with uh, them, that maybe as a result of not just the um, not just the, the challenging circumstances that might present an opportunity, but also the uh, belief uh, that there may be significant oil and gas resources um, off the coast. If you could speak to that, and and then finally, we've talked about Hezbollah. We've touched on Iran, but. How, how is Iran maneuvering here? Um, at the same time, how do the Saudis view this? Are there, there are lots of us who, who have a real interest in, in seeing how this plays out, um, but the result is that the results that we may want um, aren't always the same. So can I start, Dr. Sloan, with you to explore some of those issues? Yes, uh, I think on the Russian, if I, thank you, Congressman, if I um, can comment quickly on the Russian aspect, as, as you well pointed out, there are, uh, there is significant Russian interest in the offshore oil and gas uh, in the larger Mediterranean basin, the Levant basin. And if, uh, the, in fact, the first uh, licensing of exploration was given to a consortium of three companies, Total, Eni, and a, a, a third Russian company. And so that's part of the Russian interest, but also it's part, uh, I think part of the Russian interest has to do with expanding their footprint in the Mediterranean region. And also they see their uh, continued presence in Syria as aided by, for example, their presence in the Northern part of Lebanon, which is, uh, you know, which borders with Syria, especially in the city of Tripoli and in the port of Tripoli. There is also Chinese interest in the port of Tripoli as part of the, you know, BRI uh, uh, plan for the Middle East. So that's, that's, that's where, uh, uh, you know, the Russian interests lie, uh, primarily economic, but secondarily also political and expansionist in terms of footprint in the Middle East. Now, in terms of, sorry, maybe I should stop here and yield to my well, colleagues or to I, answer your questions. I am. I appreciate it, Dr. Slim. Um, Ms. Yakubian, I just, I'll, I'll follow up. Um, given what you describe as the total security breakdown and the bottom-up social I think, explosion, you called it, um, if you could speak to uh, how Russia seeks to benefit from that, but also how Iran is viewing this. And, and then when we talk about whether it's tough love, we talk about targeted sanctions, we talk about Magnitsky, um, how, how do, uh, do, where do we share interests with the French in, in trying to achieve that? Where are the shared interests? Where do they diverge? Look, I think that is, there is a shared interest with the French on moving on with the sanctions regime. And unless we have, unless the international community is, de approaches this issue in a concerted united effort, the Lebanese leaders have mastered the art of mining the differences in the international community to try to get away from implementing reforms, which they, in my opinion, correctly assess is going to, these reforms are going to hurt their interests, 
And so they are going to resort to any measure, you know, possible to evade that, you know, implementing these reforms. And so it's, it's very it's important. Dr. Unless I'm, I'm, sorry. I'm sorry. Let, let me st let me just stop you there for a second and, and give Ms. Yukubian an opportunity as well. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ms. Yukubian. Thank you, Chairman. Just very briefly on Russia, I think the Russians are opportunistic. I don't think they would look to try. I, I don't think they see chaos in Lebanon necessarily as working in their favor or not. I think they're purely opportunistic in their approach. Iran, on the other hand, I think, as I said before, the extent to which chaos in Lebanon enhances enhances Hezbollah's strength, quite frankly, on the ground, I think is something that that works, of course, to Iran's advantage. On the French, I think we're actually far more aligned with the French, and I actually think President Macron deserves more credit for having taken the lead on Lebanon. He is, after all, hosting the conference this next week. Here, I think U.S. leadership is actually critical, because while Macron might be interested and, and has put sort of a lot of stock in trying to elevate Lebanon, France does not have the same influence, of course, on the global stage that the U.S. does. And so I think we need to work harder uh, to align ourselves with the French um, in terms of what type of cabinet we're looking for. I think the one concern I'm worried about is that the French may accede too easily to uh, Mikati and to a check the box exercise in Lebanon that is essentially more of the same. We need to be very, very clear what we're looking for in Lebanon. Um, and I think we do also need to step up in terms of laying out that credible threat, as I said in my testimony, of sanctions across the board against all corrupt elements. Last point on the Saudis, they had sort of uh, washed their hands of Lebanon. And I think through our diplomacy, Secretary Blinken, and then later at the ambassadorial level, we're working to bring them back in to be, I hope, to play a constructive role. We need our Gulf allies on the same page as, as our European allies in addressing this challenge. Thank you. Um, thanks. And finally, Mr. Schenker, um, if we've spent a lot of time in this hearing talking about, uh, as Dr. Slim put it uh, succinctly, how everyone is corrupt, I think is how you put that, Dr. Slim, uh, focusing on the elites, uh, the, the question, and we, we all expressed, we've heard from the three of you and, and my colleagues, the concern about, uh, about mass migration, depending upon where things go. But what I, I'd like to finish with, Dr. Shanker, is to see if you can give us some sense of whether, if there is a full investigation, perhaps led by the UN, into the, the blast a year ago um, with serious repercussions uh, based on, on the results of that investigation, and if there is uh, a recognized attempt to crack down on corruption uh, and if there are whatever other steps might be necessary, is there still a chance to regain the trust of the public in Lebanon, uh, in, in the system, in democracy, uh, that, that can prevent the, the cratering of, of whatever's left? Thank you, Representative Deutsch. Uh, listen, I, I think that um, some accountability uh, would be public uh, a, a very positive step, uh, but there has been no accountability um, for any political murder um, in Lebanon, uh, as far as I can remember. Um, and we've had this tribunal, and even then we have um, uh, we have a verdict. We know this guy was a member of Hezbollah's hit squad, um, and yet there are still no steps to bring this person to accountability. And, and this is you know an endemic problem. Um, that would be helpful. But um, we are looking at a situation here um, where uh, the vast majority of the Lebanese people um, have uh, lost their lives savings, um, even if um, there is some degree of accountability and they can claw back, the international community helps to claw back some of the, these absconded funds uh, that have been stolen from Lebanese people in Europe or wherever these accounts are, uh, the Lebanese people will not be made whole um, ever. Um, and so there's going to be a lot of cynicism, um, with that and, a, and a, a mistrust that goes forward. Um, I think the Lebanese people do believe in democracy. Um, but it's a very hard thing for them to upend the system. Uh, and this system has been there for generations. Um, so it will take time, but I don't, I think the Lebanese people will go to the polls. Um, 
but I don't think that, I don't think these elections will be determinative. I think you're going to get ten seats changed, um, and I think you're going to have a very disheartened Lebanese people um, for the uh, foreseeable future, regrettably. Uh, all right, Mr. Shanker, um, thanks. I was hoping for uh, some some uh, more upbeat view uh, looking off into the future, but uh, but we ended where we started, which uh, which is a really really uh, challenging and. Uh, and difficult moment for Lebanon. I thank uh, all of our witnesses for your participation. Um, I, this is a really important and timely hearing. Your insight contributed uh, a great deal to the work that we do. Uh, thanks to all of you. Thanks to the ranking member. And with that, uh, this meeting, is, this hearing is adjourned. Thank you. Thank you.